Welcome to everyone. My name is Charlene Diaz, and I'm the head of programs for Filipinas Heritage Library, and I'll also be your host for today's event. To get our program started, let me introduce our first speaker. John B. Labellia, the head of Filipinas Heritage Library, is a scholar of literature and an award-winning poet. His poems have earned back-to-back -back first prizes from the Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards and the Philippines Free Press. A former Fulbright Fellow with a doctorate degree from Princeton, John continues to study transnationalism in Philippine literature and in Asian American poetry, as well as the relations between the United States and Latin America as represented in American poetry. He has taught at the Manila University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His recent essay linking Philippine urban studies and the crime novel is part of the anthology Beauty and Brutality, published by Temple University Press. Please give a warm welcome to John Labellia, the head of Filipinas Heritage Library. Thank you for making it out today. Very hot Saturday, making a trek here to Filipinas Heritage Library to think with us about World War II. Um, I'm going to read to save time because we have a strict time limit so that we could make more time for audience questions later. Ayala Foundation Incorporated through the Filipinas Heritage Library or FHL set up the Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures to meet the continuing need to make sense of a painful period in our nation's history, World War II. Our late benefactor, who was born in the Philippines in 1932, and whom this series of lectures commemorates, was himself a witness of war's horrors as a boy. In the book Manila Memories, Mr. Roderick Hall recalls the day the war broke out in the Pacific. His mother, Consuelo McMicking Hall, fetched him and his brother from school earlier than usual on December 8, 1941. He had just turned nine in November. He remembers hiding with other kids in the maid's room almost a month later when soldiers took his father away. His father was kept in Santo Tomas internment camp. Just when the occupation was about to end, the Hall family lost their mother to Japanese violence. It is not hard to feel the burden of this core memory. The theorist Kathy Carruth uses the phrase unclaimed experience to name painful memories such as those of wartime violence. In the face of extreme pain, the ability to understand it and to respond to it fails response gets delayed. Suffering creates a gap whose hurt sufferers relive even in their attempt to fill that gap in the aftermath. I would add that this wound cannot heal until the work of understanding occurs, until the community can give shelter anew to sufferers and help them transform that painful gap into forms of knowing. Today's talk by Carl Chang Chua addresses this kind of gap by comparing two very different sides of wartime experience, that of a Filipino woman who as a girl was captured by the Japanese military and that of a Japanese soldier mobilized in the Philippines. The books Carl discusses are items Mr. Hall himself collected with his help. And we at FHL invite you to read them at the library on the sixth floor of Ayala Museum. When the Roderick Hall collection started, our late benefactor seeded it with over 700 items. He kept looking out for materials over the years, gathering them, while working closely with the esteemed World War II historian Rico Jose, and later with Carl. Today, the library has over 5,000 items in the collection. So if you're young, there are young scholars out here, there's still much to be studied. You know, and 
And that collection holds a lot of materials that could be topics of your MA thesis or dissertations. Mr. Hall's activities embraced a diverse range of perspectives, coming to grips with other sides of the war by including materials in Japanese and Chinese. So I'm mentioning this because I want to make this appeal to scholars to learn Japanese and Chinese so that you could study our collection. To respond to Mr. Holt's legacy, his intellectual curiosity and his advocacy for dialogue and forgiveness, the library series of talks adopts the framework expanding the scope of inquiry into World War II. The Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures invite scholars to examine pre-war developments that shaped wartime, as well as to study the long shadow that it has cast well into our present time. Tom McKenna's upcoming talk, for instance, on the heroic resistance the Moros waged against the Japanese has shaped the relationship between the Philippine state and Muslim Filipinos seeking greater cultural and political autonomy in Mindanao. What the war ultimately taught Mr. Hall, I truly believe, was compassion, an aspiration to see unclaimed experience turned into knowledge, benefiting not just our country, but everyone seeking to prevent the worst from happening again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures. Thank you, John, for those insightful remarks. Now let's hear from some of Roderick Hall's closest collaborators as they pay tribute to a dear friend. Rod described himself as a man with a mission and a man in a hurry. His mission was to collect as many materials on the experiences of Filipinos during World War II and to place them in a library that would ensure that these are shared with today's generation as well as those in the future. And he found this repository as well as partners with us in the Filipinas Heritage Library. So in 2010, Broad shipped his entire collection, lock, stock, and barrel of 700 volumes from his home in London to FHL in Makati. Through the years, his collection has grown to more than 2,000 print and non-print materials on World War II, making the Roderick Hall collection FHL's crown jewel. As such, it is FHL's centerpiece, literally and figuratively, because we now revolve our collection focus around the period immediately before, during, and right after World War II, identified as the formative period of Filipino nation. To collect books and various other historical materials relating to the Philippines during that war and to make this more accessible to the general public. He turned this collection over to the Filipinas Heritage Library, where it now forms a major part of its holdings as the Roderick Hall Collection. But Rod was not one to simply donate books. He wanted other people to use them and to research more on the war. He wanted to add more materials and was constantly in search of new directions for the collection. To this end, he was able to negotiate digitization of numerous manuscripts in various collections around the Philippines. He wanted to provide as many different perspectives as possible. And when he learned of the large body of works in Japanese, aimed to acquire as much as possible for the collection. Why are you collecting Japanese publications about the battle of Philippines, even though you do not understand Japanese language. You said to me, I always answer 
It's a this question like that. I want next future generation to know what happened in Philippines during the Asia Pacific War and the Philippines under Japanese rule. However, you told me the real reason is that collecting Japanese books is to make peace of my mind and making requiem for my deceased family as a post-war Japanese generation. I promise you to try to make no more war society and also to try not to create the kind of people such as you and your family horribly experienced in Philippines. I think the Japanese should know the facts of this history. I believe this is my mission as a Japanese. <laughs> previous century, its many upheavals and wars, is that we all have an ethical obligation to remember that history. But understandably, not everyone takes up that burden because the memory of war, especially for persons who witnessed it, is painful. The late Mr. Rod Hall was deeply courageous in that sense of taking up an ethical burden he took pains to give World War II its proper mourning, not just for himself, but also for our country, America and Japan, whose materials he collected. He helped strengthen our cultural memory in the hope of preventing the return of suffering. And now with his passing, we in turn at Philippines Heritage Library and the Ayala Foundation have an obligation to make his legacy and his commemoration history and viewer. FHL also wishes to extend our gratitude to the Roderick Hall family for generously supporting this lecture series. We would not be able to spread awareness about the Roderick Hall collection and the legacy of World War II on the Philippines without the family's support. Now we would like to introduce our speaker. Carl Ian Cheng Chua is a professorial lecturer of the Asian Center, University of the Philippines. He recently finished graduate school in sciences at Tsubashi University. He serves as a member of the editorial Asian Journal of Culture, Comedy, Aesthetic, and practice at Social Science de Liman. He is also a longtime collaborator of Roderick Hall and is very familiar with the Japanese side of the collections that he is activating today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Carl Ian Chengchua. Hello. Um, Good afternoon, and uh, I'm really grateful for the Philippines Heritage Library and Rod Hall Collection for inviting me to this talk. Uh, just to start, all right. So 
uh, this, pro this talk is actually part of a book project um, by Japanese study scholars. So as a formal concept, I'm not a Filipinist. I, I work with Japan. And uh, the project was basically to write about um, Japanese war art created by Japanese interns. It's a very beautiful project, but one of the things that I actually then thought about is, wait a minute, by doing so, it, while it does humanize the Japanese, it created a problem, particularly to my positionality because I'm Filipino, right? So am I going to write something that makes um, a piece where the Japanese are actually going to be, you know, pitied or at the very least humanized? So it created a very complex issue for me. And that was why I remembered and became the person that became difficult for this project. <laughs> and that's why I remembered uh, stuff that I collected for the Rod Hall collection, looked at it, and tried to create a compromise with my, uh, my colleagues. And this is the result of this project, right? And uh, it was quite surprising, but at the same time, I was really happy with the idea, right? All right, so uh, allow me to read some of it because if I go away, I tend to chat a little bit. So um, despite the normalization of Philippine-Japan uh, diplomatic relations in 1956 with an agreement for reparations of war loss, the rise of Japanese, stud uh, the rise of Japanese studies in 1966, scholarship, in, um, scholarship on Japanese soldiers who fought in the Philippines in World War II was still limited to a simplistic view of how the Japanese were, uh, were the worst transgressors in Philippine history. If you recall your own Philippine histories, right? This can be explained in part by the strong nationalist approach of um, post war Filipino historians that often demonize foreigners in, in an attempt to affirm Philippine identity. Uh, not a problem, but it's something that exists within our space. Um, and that aside, we have to. Um, but nonetheless, we need, to uh, we need to consider the fact that the harsh experiences of Filipinos during the Japanese occupation um, are still widely remembered, uh, whatever, that, um, wh whatever that dimension is. Uh, this long post-war history includes the um, un remembering the very unpopular pop proclamation and then President Elpidio Carino granting, um, granting executive clemency to 100, 105 Japanese war criminals in July 22, 1953. 1953. Um, however, what was poignant about what uh, uh, President Carino stated was that um, I should be the last one to pardon them as the Japanese killed my wife and three children and five other members of my family. I'm doing this because I do not want my children and my people to inherit from me hate for a people who might be friends for a permanent interest in our country. After all, destiny has made, um, de destiny has made us neighbors, which is quite poignant because it's basically the same thing that sort of Rod um, envisioned for his own collection, right? So, uh, so what am I working with? Um, I'm working with uh, two books that were published that are now, which I purchased for the collection. Um, it is a compilation of letters and diaries by two Japanese um, individuals. However, um, as a process, we have to be careful. This is nothing new. As looking at letters and looking at um, diaries is nothing new as a method, um, as a historical practice. Um, both can, um, both are actually useful because the language is plain. In other words, you're not going through highly technical concepts. But um, one of the problems that we have to caution in using this material is in its initial inception, these letters and these diaries were not privy to your audience. In other words, they were actually personal, personal documents. Um, uh, so we, or we're not supposed to have seen these material. Uh, however, um, due to the post-war concepts of Japan, some of these families were brave and courageous enough to actually publish them, initially self-publishing to circulate to their own families so that they could, uh, so that their families could know how, what, ex what experiences their grandfathers or their fathers had done. However, sometimes, um, sometime in the late um, future, 
uh, some of them would be commercially published. So in other words, what I'm going to be using are the ones commercially published. Uh, and that's where I now have access to the material. But the other caution, the, the other caution in, cautionary tale that we have is that we cannot take these letters, uh, we cannot take these letters and, um, oh, sorry, these letters and diaries in, um, in its entire truth, particularly because the Japanese military authority had actually created military manuals, um, which required everyone, both um, anyone in Japan, to not write about the harshness of war. So in other words, while the war was happening, um, it, they made sure that everyone was fighting for the war itself. So, uh, so in this case, the letters of the soldiers cannot tell you about the, the harsh realities that they experience. Because when their loved ones read it, the, um, the people in the, home, in the home country would now lose support. Why are you killing my son? Why are you killing my husband? Um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, on the other hand, the same military manuals also mandate the people in the mother country do not write about how they miss uh, their relatives, right? That, oh, I miss you, your son is now growing up, um, your grandfather is dying, and so on, because it then, uh, it then, uh, decreases morale of the soldiers fighting in the field itself. So in other words, I am using these materials with a caution that you now had a controlled memory um, within this space. But it's not just for the Japanese themselves. Um, part of my research is also about self-reflexivity. Did we as Filipinos or did Americans uh, also during this time have the same mandates which we, have not, which we haven't actually known about, right? So what, why is this important? Because it then creates a political economy to what was allowed to be written, right? Instead of just taking it as truth. So that was one of the things that I had to, um, to be cautious about this. So who did I actually choose? Uh, the, the, um, the first one is Maida Michio. I could not find a picture of him, unfortunately, so I just have an illustration of his wife. Um, born in 1914 and unfortunately passed in 1945. In other words, he actually died in, um, in the Philippines. Right? Uh, he was born in Kobe and he was a painter, which tells you later about the type of work that he has. Right? Um, uh, and he was sent to the Philippines as a soldier in 1944, which is quite important because uh, it, this is not someone that was sent in 41, where there's going to be a lot of uh, struggles that are still happening, resistance movements. Um, and we are not looking at the period of peace, 1943, when things have already settled, right? So in other words, these are the unfortunate people that have to pick up the eventual mess of the, of the near end of the war. On the other hand, Komatsu Shinichi was born in 1911 and survives the war until he passes away in 1973. Um, he was born in Tokyo and he's an engineer. Uh, and he was sent to the Philippines not as a soldier, but as a civilian military personnel um, in order to um, study whether they could produce butanol in the Philippines itself, right? Particularly, uh, he will be based in uh, Bacolod. And, you'll, and hopefully you'll be able to see some of the um, uh, pictures that are there. Great. Great. So just to give you the lay of the land, I'm not giving everything because uh, as part of what this talk is about, I'm going to encourage you to also look at the materials itself. As a historian, I'm trying to piece my own story about these two. And uh, I'm not using all of the material that is there. I was just looking at particular patterns. Um, in the case of Maida Michio, he had about 728 postcards of around 132 were sent from the Philippines. Um, 100, only 39 were published. But the sad thing is uh, the wife would only receive uh, around 500 of these postcards. So, uh, and the only reason we're able to know this is because of the serial numbers in the postcard itself, which the wife will eventually talk about that weight. 
there are some there are some serial numbers missing. Um, so in other words, there's there's still some stuff that not that weren't there. On the other hand, Komatsu Shinichi would write around eleven diaries, and the book that you that we have in the collection uh, compiles all four of the oh, only four of the eleven diaries. It has sixty illustrations that were all of the Philippines themselves, right? So why, what is the problem that I work with in this space? Within Japan, we would think of this as a commercial publication, but within Japan, what we would then look at it is what they label as peace literature. What do we mean by peace literature? Uh, to those who are familiar with contemporary Japan, we tend, to, we tend to highlight them as people who are peace loving because of their constitution. Right? And this is part of those materials to encourage them to know about um, the evils of war so that they no longer need to continue becoming a country that, um, in, that goes to war in the future. But um, there will be two problems within this. On the one hand, you have um, Korean Jae Hyun Lim, uh, who, uh, who talks about the issues of this of these peace literature. It creates the concept of victimhood nationalism. In other words, you emphasize the victimhood, of the victimhood um, in order to uh, create a better positioning, right? Uh, and that is what, that, why is this problematic for the, pe for the peace literatures? Um, the peace literatures actually become a historical. When we say a historical, that means they're not historically inaccurate, but rather it removes particular context to this history. We are not removing the fact that the Japanese suffered, including these two men. But what is absent in this uh, in this array of peace literature, particularly to my positionality, is how Filipinos suffered in the same war itself, right? So in other words, um, I'm not belittling their suffering, but it is absent, um, but what is absent here are the other sufferings intertwined in this war, right? One particular solution was um, presented by my uh, uh, dissertation advisor, Nakano Satoshi. He presented this in De La Salle University a couple of years ago, um, where he presents the idea of virtuous cycle um, to prevent the vicious cycles of violence. What we have to then work with is the virtuous cycle of forgiveness. Um, one of these examples, I think we recently um, commemorated it, was during the Memorare, where year after year, you will have people from all, um, people from, um, all communities, Americans, Filipinos, Japanese, um, anyone who was in the Philippines gathering in that same commemorative space, to which, while it is symbolic, the Japanese would constantly say sorry, the Filipinos would accept this, and you know there is that um, there is that concept of commemoration, right? So it's not just a single one-hand idea that um, Japan says sorry. It's a constant yearly process of doing so. But this is one of the suggestions. I may agree with it, but I may not disagree <laughs> with it as well. But uh, we shall see. Um, so. Here's the meat. Here's the first meat of my um, presentation. Uh, I compiled it into three categories. What I saw as interesting um, patterns. The first one is they would illustrate a lot of fauna and flora. Um, oh, sorry. And why it's actually problematic is remember that this was published during um, 1944. In other words, you're assuming that they're supposed to give you an illustration of what was happening in the Philippines in this space. So it was very peculiar why they had to choose, why both artists actually chose this type of theme. Um, uh, Maeda, Maeda would actually give you some, a lot of these type of idyllic um, pencil, uh, idyllic lines, uh, very soft in art concepts. And so you don't feel that it's actually war, right? So when, the, when his wife reads it, it practices similar to what the military manuals are saying. When you see it, it's at peace. Um, and he gives you a lot of brief descriptions, such as this is um, water buffaloes, we don't have them in Japan, and so on. 
Uh, however, um, this Gumamela is his first letter to his wife. Uh, he writes at the back of the letter, um, there are so many subjects um, that I can draw about um, that I was at the loss as to what to draw. I settled on this flower. I don't know what it's called. Um, I painted it. Um, I painted it because it was the first thing that like, caught my eye when I landed in the islands. Um, I, will send, I will send you my first impression. Um, my message is simple. The meaning behind it is not. As a flower blooming under intense heat of the sun has a strong color, I too am trying to be strong here, uh, to, uh, strong here as well. Please do not worry. Right. So it's a very, very touching piece. But at the same time, it creates two interesting concepts, right? Someone that doesn't know it's a gumamela. And for me, for us as Filipinos, that's a gumamela. <laughs> so, you know, it becomes this interesting conversation of sorts. But yet, it still works within the idea of the idyllic nature that he was writing this during the period of war. On the other hand, you have uh, uh, Komatsu who would then, you'll know that it's Komatsu's illustrations because he only does penciling hard lines and so on because he's a diarist, not an artist. He was not a trained artist itself. So all, everything that he saw in the Philippines was always about science. Particularly remember that he was here, um, he was actually in charge to make, to ensure that they could create butanol. Um, to those who are not familiar with it, butanol is actually used as part of the explosive. Um, uh, it's an ingredient that you actually need for, explosion, um, for explosive materials. Um, primarily, it, um, primarily, they needed to access sugarcane, but the Americans were kind of smart and, smart and tragically um, harsh because they burned all of the sugar cane in Victoria. So they had to look for an alternative um, source. And that was why um, they tried to look at coconut. And the non-scientist in me had to go through that book and read how he was annoyed because it was a very difficult process. In order to create butanol using um, coconut, you needed to add protein. Unfortunately, the protein content in coconut was so weak. Um, so in, term, in other words, it's a very inefficient form of supply. But nonetheless, this was his, in his diaries, and he will have a lot of these computations about it. And hence, um, despite, the, despite this fact, um, they would still proceed with creating a butanol plantation in the jungles of Victorias. Um, to which where he will be staying. But the nice thing as well, at the end of the war, what becomes interesting is we're not only looking at fauna and flora as idyllic, now that Japan is eventually losing in the war, um, Komatsu would now run, um, run away from the American soldiers and the guerrilla forces. So at the very end, he would then write um, in contemporary speak, um, he was now food blogging. Because he was trying to find, um, trying to find food um, in the mountains of Negros. But part of the problem here is remember that these are people that were not familiar with the terrain and the fauna and flora in the Philippines. It is already known that the Japanese, the Japanese soldiers that were sent um, abroad did not know where their final destinations were. So they could not prepare. So. Um, for Komatsu, he was actually, because he's a scientist, yeah, <laughs> he brings with him a, um, a, encyclo a pocket encyclopedia of edible food items. And he would try to check what they were, right? And hence, um, he creates a lot of these types of illustrations. On the side, you will see him talking about um, the animal, um, river crabs, grasshoppers, and how he cooks them, right? Um, and he would also say something like, uh, they're, they're either delicious, like the river crabs, or in this case, with this illustration, he says it's lucky if you can actually find nests, because not, uh, not only will he be able to eat the, the, the birds, but you can also eat the eggs. But he, he writes a poignant thing in the 
um, in the diaries by saying, it's sad that I'm actually killing two things just to have my stomach fed, right? Uh, he doesn't say how he cooks it um, and in that point. Um, for the frogs, he had, he had a very, at the back of his diary, he has a very meticulous process. Unfortunately, he doesn't like the texture of the skin. So, and it was very difficult for him to peel um, the frog itself. And hence, you'll have that type of descriptions uh, in doing so. Oh, sorry. Um, however, one of the things that he, while well, I didn't put it here as, an uh, as part of the illustration, um, one, of the, uh, one of the most memorable foods he had were, um, most of the insects in the Philippines for him were disgusting, particularly because um, despite the fact that they have texture, most of them are oily. But please don't try that. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it becomes like, huh? How? Oh, what? What do? What do you mean by that? But nonetheless, um, it becomes this interesting conversation and food blog. But if you read it, right? Um, on the one hand, the fauna and flora of Maeda gives you an idyllic atmosphere, right, of to his wife. But on the other hand, particularly later at the end of the war, Komatsu's. Uh, Komatsu's illustrations talk about his suffering. So you see both sides of this peace literature concept, right? The next one, it, it's basically a repet repetition. Um, I could have said people and places, but it doesn't sound sexy for a historian. So locales and locales, right? Some <laughs> people will still read me. Um, again, the idea here is that idyllic aesthetics. Um, Again, you'll know that this is Maeda because he's a trained painter. His lines are beautiful. And remember, he enters Japan, he enters the Manila um, in 1944. So they were supposed to be preparing for war. And this is all in Tramuros, as you see there, the right. Um, and um, he takes it as his thing to actually illustrate a lot of these, um, a lot of um, people, like a sorbetero. Um, uh, someone pounding rice, the tramvia, and so on. Right. So once again, it creates a very um, a very suspicious um, idea of what Manila was, particularly because you know there there's supposed to be war. Um, later landings will happen in a year. The guerrillas are already killing left and right outside of Manila itself, and yet you have such beautiful pictures. Um, similar to maybe Amor Solo. <laughs> but if you think about it, you can also say that because a lot of Amor Solo's paintings were painted in the war. And that's also part of a criticism for Amor Solo right? <laughs> as well. Uh, so, you know, beautiful stuff. Um, and Luneta, right? On the other hand, you see again the diarist being more visceral. Um, on the one hand, um, he enters Manila, but for one of the first things that he sees is the um, the adventurous women peddling themselves for prostitution. Uh, on the one, um, take note, these are not comfort women, but rather we do recognize that during that time, prostitution was already um, one of the legitimate trades. And at the same time, during the war, the war economy was highly problematic that uh, a lot of people had to work in alternative um, alternative um, work spaces in order to just earn income. But uh, he writes here that this was before Yamashita, the General Yamashita actually enters Manila. And um, there's a lot of soldiers that are playing with women. So are we, he was trying to be critical about the Japanese military itself by saying, are we really in war? Why are you doing all of these things, right? But it also tells you about the confid the arrogance, confidence of the Japanese, <laughs> that they were not gonna lose the Philippines. Uh, later on, um, part of the viscerality is Filipino children. This is in Calamba, uh, where he was eventually going to be interned. Uh, I had to remove uh, one of the slides there because uh, 
um, ah, one of the illustrations there because one of the children was saying putang ina <laughs> uh, but he didn't understand it so the only thing he wrote there is bakayaro <laughs> uh, which is also the idea of um, the Philippines so he was con uh, he was counteracting the uh, message of the Japanese to uh, that the Filipinos were actually welcoming them in the reality especially during the post-war a lot of the Filipinos were now actually quite hateful of the Japanese themselves. One of the interesting conversations here is a gender um, flip. I didn't put this as an illustration, but a Philippine in the internment camp, one of the Filipina um, internment mistresses would try to actually investigate a crime in the internment camp in Kalamba. And um, he, uh, Komatsu actually writes that he was afraid of this woman because all this Filipino woman had to do was point at you and your head would be cut off. So, you know, it becomes this very interesting um, conversations that he was now writing within this concept, right? Uh, and part of the floor, oh, this is Komatsu. Um, and um, this is the Victoria um, butanol, uh, butanol factory uh, in the mountains. Um, I befriended his grandson. Um, I think this is not part of the book, but he gave me access into this. And one of the grandsons wish is to come to the Philippines because he wanted to see where his grandfather went. Um, and when he, when he knew that I was Ilongo, he said, like, can you bring me there? I said, like, no, I'm, I'm from Iloilo, not Bacolod. <laughs> but nonetheless, yeah, he, he's quite an interesting person. Right. The front lines become slightly visceral um, on the head of Komatsu, but still, um, but still the soldier Maeda would still be a little bit much more soft, right? So you'll see the very distinct differences. This is, my, um, this is Maeda um, riding his ship to the Philippines, um, and um, he would write dates where they were and so on, right? Um, however, as the sad part here at the end um, with Komatsu, uh, nearing the end of the war, what they had to do was destroy the factory. Because once they heard that the Americans were already, um, were already in a position to invade um, Negros itself, they didn't want their own resources to be used by the um, by the enemy nationals. And hence, what it did was they had to burn the factory um, and all of its production uh, that was there, which unfortunately ended up creating a large, not forest fire, but probably the entire mountains were burning and then they had to run away as well. So it was a double jeopardy for them. Right? Um, uh, part of that viscerality is them running away and out of these mountains and trying to then see vestiges of, of these soldiers. Who were they? What they were? Um, one of these, I didn't put it here because it was a little more graphic. Um, he, do he documents how because of the lack of food as they were trying to run away, um, some of the Japanese soldiers had to resort to cannibalism. Um, but um, there are two forms of cannibalism that existed in his records. The first one was basically they eat each other. Um, on the other hand, they would eat corpses. Right? So, but again, um, part of the reason I'm discussing this is that's what peace literature does, right? Uh, you're, the, the, the experience has to have like, yuck. Ooh. It, it makes you think about the war. And if you are a Japanese national and sort of put yourself in that position, you then create that same emotive idea. Yeah, war is evil, war is bad, right? But once again, it creates the problem of the absence that the Filipino is not there within this space, right? right. Um, then um, a lot of it, I didn't go into this because um, my uh, my... Uh, my collaborators were more focused on the internment camps um, and uh, a lot of things that happened in the internment camps uh, were quite interesting, but it was al already unwieldy for me. So he gives you an illustration of everything that happened in the internment camps in the last volumes of his diaries, and it's heavily documented. 
um, and illustrate that that's there. All right. So that's the first part. You get a feel of what these literature is, um, a, a taste of what these illustrations do. Um, but part of the topic that I wanted to, to talk about was the afterlives. We're not just looking at what, um, what we feel about it, but what problems do exist once these are commercially published. On the one hand, um, the intention of it being published in Japanese means that we're not we as Filipinos are not supposed to read it, right? Nor are we able to understand it. But you know, this idiot knows Japanese and this idiot actually read it. And hence it creates now a new problem for me, right? Like how then can we, how then can we position this? Particularly when, for those that are familiar with World War II literature, the Americans, particularly in Santo Tomas, have actually heavily illustrated their experiences in Santo Tomas as interns, which I think we also have in the Rod Hall collection. And when you then take the two together, understanding that these now exist, how do you now think about it, right? Um, how, do you position, how do you position the understanding of um, these experiences, particularly when prior to what we saw, right, the, the Japanese internment diaries, um, our understanding was just about the Americans and their suffering in Santo Tomas, right? So it now adds into this knowledge and it creates that dilemma, particularly for us and particularly for the Americans themselves, right, um, in this case. Uh, the other thing is um, there are now more afterlives um, for the two diaries. This one, um, don't worry, it's long. Um, this is, you can find this in YouTube. Um, what happens is um, Maeda's diary was uncovered by the post-war Japanese. And what they're now doing is a concert um, where there will be orchestras there. Um, so in other words, what they're now doing is a live reading of the... Um, letters of Maeda to his wife. Don't worry, we won't watch the entire thing. And it's accessible in YouTube. If you want to do the closed, uh, the subtitling, feel free to do so. But what, what is this experience for? Right. Oh, there. That is Maeda and his wife. Right. Um, it creates a further step towards um, peace literature, right? Because you now create a more emotive idea. Yeah. Oh, this is just background. But anyway, anyway the, the idea here is, so what does that do? If you read the practice, imagine these private intimate things that you were able to then only read you're now creating voice to it. It doesn't help that the, you know, the music is classical. So, syempre, after that, I, <laughs> right? The, the audio, the, the intensity of, and they really performed it well. Why? Because the, the man is dead. <laughs> the wife is living. So, it then further creates a, a problem towards this afterlife because it then embeds the idea that the Japanese were kawawa, were suffering. Furthermore, um, this is a well, um, this is in Mugongkan. This is also accessible online if you want to search for it. Um, it's a recording of Maeda's wife, who talks about her experience. Mugongkan voice library. Yeah. Maeda Michio. So at least you'll hear the real voice of Maeda the wife. Maeda Michio was 1914年大正3年6月24日神戸市垂水区に生まれました。昭和12年 and if you're in Nagano, um, feel free to go to this. The, the curator is a little nutty, but he's, fun. he's an old man that collects all of these types of um, art materials for war. And you, know, you just have to deal with him, but the collection is so beautiful. Yeah. Hold on,
この間前田道夫は婚約時代も含めて妻の絹子さんに、so、728年間の婚約を書き上げました。So、絹子さんはその後再婚して高沢絹子となり、はい、横浜市戸塚区に住んでおられますが、道夫のハガキへの画文集を出版し、展覧会を開いておられます。高沢絹子さんに伺いました。私が女学校出ましたのが12年で、からあの彼が出ましたのも昭和12年で。So part of the drama here is that、um, mugon kan just means that、um, it's a place with no sound. まあうちの父にしてみれば、right. これはいいチャンスだ。So but what you see here is there's no visuality. This is just the wife narrating his her experiences of. 私も嫌いじゃなかったですし。Yeah. Um, she describes about how he didn't really like his husband, <laughs> but you know. It was funny, Dao, so okay. <laughs> funny Trump's handsome, s <laughs> u g e But anyway, you know,、uh, it humanizes the person, but at the same time,、um, it's part of these afterlives, and it's part of the afterlives of its post war histories, right?、Um, and incidentally, the entire collection of, of the postcards that the wife has received is now permanently in, this,、um, in the Itami City Museum of Art. Um, we have the catalog in the Rod Hall collection as well. So, whatever you could not see,、um, all 500 are actually part of this catalog if you're interested.、Um, so, this is also part of its afterlives. On the other hand, Komatsu would actually create a media frenzy for himself.、Um, once they realized that this is someone that survived the war, he would actually. Published in a lot of magazines and newspapers, who would give a lot of talks.、Um, you know, it's really about the political economy creating how the Japanese soldier, or how a Japanese civilian military、um, personnel had actually suffered in the Philippines. Right?、Um, and of course, part of what I do is I actually、um, research on children's literature. So he also has a children's a picture book version of his diary. Um, I'm still trying to access some of it because it's, this is in 1995, if I'm not mistaken, and it's a part of a set, and it's very difficult to look for it without breaking the set. Right. Um, but um, what becomes interesting for Komatsu for everyone is、um, you can also access his,、um, his grandson actually built a website, which also has a Twitter, YouTube, Uh, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and website for this. And he translates it. His wife is Taiwanese. And that's how I met him. And we talk about it. So, you know,、um, it tells you about how he's actually using、um, this peace concept for, his, uh, uh, for this agenda himself. Right.、Um, right. So that's one. Right. We talk about the sufferings of the Japanese, and we cannot remove that suffering s from,、um, from the Japanese. It's the truth. But、um, aside from looking at the interned, um, the, interned, uh, uh, the interned Americans in Santo Tomas, another thing that we have to re also recognize is the war art of the Filipinos. But the problem is、um, I, we have very limited war art,、uh, whatever you would call war art itself. One of which,、um, as John had actually mentioned, is a、um, picture diary by Remedios Felias, which was published in Japan,、uh, who,、um, documents her experiences, uh, that, uh, who documents her experience that, as a girl that was taken by the Japanese soldiers.、Right? Um, it's、um, published both in Japanese and they would have her handwritings on these. But part of the issue, to those that are not familiar with this, is that this is part of the 1995 histories of comfort women, where remember that in order to document whether comfort women existed, you needed to have physical proof,、um, material proof of its existence. Unfortunately, because there was no material proof, what the women had to do was then illustrate their experiences. But from a historical lens, it creates two problems, right? Because on the one hand, it is memory. But it is memory of what happened to them in the 1940s, which are now illustrating in 1995. And that's where we have that complex issue.、Uh, 
while you have on the one hand the problems of memory and memoirs for the Japanese themselves, particularly for this, if you want to read it, um, we also have the issue of the memory of this woman, right? Because how uh, I, not not demeaning the idea that there is some uh, there might be uh, there might be some historical inaccuracies to her memory. Um, that is also something that the Japanese are also targeting, and that's why we're still not progressing within our own um, within our own um, cases with it, especially within this case, right? So um, and while it is tragic, it is emotive on our end. Um, the other thing that we have to also understand, again, self-reflexivity, it's not a Philippine press that published this, right? It's actually a Japanese press. So in other words, it also creates the issue of then, what have we done <laughs> as Philippines? So that creates a complex idea for me as a Filipino Japanese studies per, a scholar, right? Because I, I am able to also see this in the problems of what our spaces have um, to offer, right? So, where do where am I um, sort of wrapping up within this idea? Um, I, I'm giving you a brief um, hint to what I I read within these uh, with within these art materials. We are able to see the sufferings of the Japanese, and we are able to then humanize the Japanese that were here in the Philippines themselves, right? But at the same time, um, we are able to also understand the lay of our land, particularly the ones that we've learned in our, in our own formal education, or what we already know as part of our historical memory. But what now creates a problem here? So what do we now do? What do we now do from now on? Um, in the chapter that I did, I create a, a, comp, uh, a, a particular problem. Who's suffering is the worst? Who should we be more pitiful for? And that's what uh, uh, Jehun Nim's um, vict victimhood nationalism creates as a dilemma, that if we constantly just emphasize um, the idea of victimhood, this circle of violence will never end. Because what will happen eventually is that everyone will just keep on competing as to who is suffering. Who is suffering the most in this event? So much so that I'm using um, history of violence um, philosophers, um, Polonsky and Miklik, who have written um, as a final thing. Assuming that the global public sphere tends to be more symp sympathetic to the innocent victim, nations are increasingly engaged in a distasteful con competition over who suffered the most. And that's where, unfortunately, I end my chapter. Because it's a, something to think about in our in this space. I'm not here to say that the Japanese have actually suffered, but how do we then move on? What do we work with the knowledges that we have? And how do we work with it within the space of art? So thank you. And I wait for your questions. sensitive topic about the war. We will now move on to the Q&A, and I'm sure our audience is eager to continue this discussion. So let's officially open the floor for questions. For our on-site audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and a member of our staff will bring you a microphone. For Zoom attendees, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. We give priority to that box over questions typed in the chat box. And for Facebook viewers, please use the comment section of the Facebook live stream, and we'll do our best to get to all your questions. Are there brave volunteers in the audience who would like to get us started? Um, yes. Omar, I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, uh, thank you very much, Professor Chua, and thank you, Charlene. Uh, you know, fools rush in where the, the, the intelligence appear to tread. So I'll be the first fool. Uh, it's a, a very, very interesting lecture. I, I actually, what intrigued me, Dr. Chua, you know, about war and being an old man now and having to face things is what makes it easy to kill somebody? It's the act of killing to me as a, as a man who is, you know, who's a soldier. Yeah. What makes it easy for you to kill or rape, a kill a man, right. rape a woman? And so with that in mind, when you looked at the literature here, uh, both the Japanese side and the uh, American side and the Filipino side, the Japanese, you know, were compelled and stamped with the, um, the code of Bushido, the art of war, and you were taught uh, Bushido, right? And it, would, it could allow you to do just incredible acts of cruelty, <laughs> right? The Americans were taught also the code uh, of honor, but, but you know, the enemy is the enemy. They're nothing like you. Uh, the woman you're raping is not your mother or your sister. The man you're killing is not your brother. They are something objectified and different. So you kill them with ease, you rape them with ease. So my question to you is, in the literature that you looked at, was there any material uh, in the Japanese side or the American side or the Filipino side, uh, well, not so much the Filipinos because the Japanese were and Americans were really the, the perpetrators. The yeah. Filipinos were collateral damage to some degree. Okay. Was there anything where these people started to have self doubts? Oh, okay. Where they, you know, they, they they had to kill somebody maybe, or they were, and they started to think, "Am I doing this? Uh, is this a right thing for me to do? I mean, I'm forced to do it because I'm a soldier." Right. Is this right? right? Did Bushido really want this? Or yeah. did the code of honor for the US forces want ah, this? Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the question itself. Um, uh, it actually relates to my dissertation because uh, um, what I uh, what I actually focus on is not this. I don't like adult literature. I prefer children's literature. And uh, how I how I positioned that idea was, and it's also the same thing for the Americans and also for Filipinos um, in this case, is you create an image of an other. In other words, you don't look at the person as human. So um, my dissertation basically looked at um, children's literature pre-war, 1930s to 1960s, and looked at how they represented the Filipinos. And during that time, they represented Filipinos as savages, black-skinned savages. You have the same histories in the Americans when they, um, when they illustrate the Amer African-Americans, Pekingese, and so on and so forth. So in other words, you create an image to the child that these are not the same stock as you. So much so that uh, my, my, th my, my thesis for that was it made them grow up as adults recognizing that I'm not talking to an equal, I'm talking to an other, right? And, um, and that was the practice that we're then kind of seeing. That's why I, I really like visuality, simply because as you saw, it's easy for you to consume, despite the fact that you don't know how to read Japanese. You see the image and immediately, you'll be able to then judge whether you like it or not. So much so that Maeda and his heavily, nicely trained arts training creates soft lines. So in other words, the first thing that happens is you don't reject the image, right? You get drawn into the image itself. But if you work with hard lines like um, Komatsu, you find it dirty, you might not look at it. Or if you look at um, Remedios' work, particularly to those that are um, sensitive to trauma, you turn away. In other words, you reject the image. So part of it is that. The histories of illustrations allow you to then create images of the other. And by doing so, you're then able to um, depersonalize them. Um, and hence, it's easier for you to then create an act violence um, to these um, individuals. But of course, there, are, there could be other arguments to it in that end. But thanks, very, very interesting question. Other questions you have? Uh, yes. Um, a microphone for 
Okay. Um, again, thank you for today's talk, Dr. Cheng Chiu. Um, I'm interested in what you mentioned regarding the fact that of your two subjects, one was relatively kept private, mm. and then one was actively published mm. uh, immediately after. I, I've been familiar with the fact that soldiers ultimately tend to write war memorials. Mm. Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm just kind of interested first, um, what's the usual mm. distribution? Are, are you familiar perhaps with the distribution line, mm. at least in Japan? Mm. Who tends to publish these things? Who motivates okay. people? Who gathers and then okay. markets these things? And what's the target audience okay. like? All right. And then perhaps second, um, to what extent um, do you, uh, no, are we dealing with the problem of soldiers truthfully confessing to what they're doing and to what extent are they also perhaps as you mentioned modulating the storyline okay. right. so that they I, i'm assuming there's a conscience question as well in right. their storytelling perhaps right. so yeah thank you all right thank you um so there are two layers to this uh if we're looking at memoirs which is a and it also um with this answer it can also be a self-reflection on how uh, also americans and how filipinos also do this at the same time we everyone has war veterans and they record their experiences in the war. So the first thing they wanted to do was to ensure that at least their relatives know what happened. So it's a private um, interaction. And hence, the first stage is always going to be self-publication. You write your memoirs, and then during the reunions, you just distribute to, to everyone so that at the very least, you know, this is what Lolo did. Um, this is what Lola did during the war, right? Um, so at the very end, it's just very personal. You get to understand your family's history. However, um, because of the political economy in Japan, where they want to push the idea of pacifism, how do we now encourage more people to know to become pacifists? Right? It's yes, the constitution is there, but you also then have the courage to then sell it to commercial publishers. There's a lot of these small time commercial publishers that love this type of genre. And that's why they have that genre of peace literature, right? For the Philippines, unfortunately, we don't have war literature, right? All, everything is either history um, and so on. So it's subsumed under a large category. For Japan, they're very particular. They have peace literature. And there are a lot of publishers that like this. So their, pub, um, their circulations are quite strong. Um, to those that do anime and manga, one of the most popular piece literature is the Hiroshima manga of um, Barefoot Gen, um, Hadashi no Gen, right? That is still being repub constantly republished by up to now, which is a story of a boy and his family's experience during the um, Hiroshima atomic bomb explosion, right? Um, for the, those that are younger, there is the recent one, um, uh, Honoyona Katatsumori, uh, in this corner of the world, the manga and anime itself, it also has that form of genre. So who are buying it? It's exactly that. It creates the idea that, oh, kawawa naman kami, <laughs> because we suffered in this war. So those are those people. And that's why when you look at the, um, when you look at anti-war protests in, in these spaces, we are able to then see why they actually are strong in terms of it, simply because they're not looking, uh, most, if not all, are looking at, we don't want other people to suffer, but we're actually looking at the literature of how our people have suffered, right? Uh, and we don't want that to happen again. So, uh, so it becomes that very complex uh, nature. And of course, um, it doesn't just mean that it's allowed, because recently, um, like also in the US, there are the, the right-wing Japanese are also doing a lot of book bans. So anything that's this sensitive, they're also removed from, uh, from public libraries as well. So, so you know, there's that, there, there is these changes that are also happening in this space, but nonetheless, um, they, um, they are allowed. So, um, which is then, if we look within our own Philippine case, I'm not sure about the American one, um, we do have a lot of World War II, not only children's literature, it's accessible as well in the Philippine Heritage Library, but um, also a lot of memoirs by people who lived here. But what you'll notice is that we, own, we never survive a single print, right? And remember that in the Philippines, I think we get a bestseller if we can sell around 2,500 copies. 
right? So in other words, what happens here, what's a struggle for someone that's interested in World War II, especially if you want to do memory, is that if you don't buy it during the time that it's published, it's going to be very difficult for you to look for it. Right? And that's where, that's a problem in terms of our, um, our commercial publishing economies, right? Uh, that uh, we rarely find someone that has been constantly being republished in World War II. Um, and hence, you know, um, our, our feelings towards it are slowly degrading as well. But yeah, but thanks for the question. Carl, if it's okay, I'm sure. going to switch to Zoom for sure. a moment because our chat box is starting to fill up. All right. um, our first question is from Lito Lacaba, who uh -huh. says, thanks for a very informative talk, Sir Chua. I am curious in how you determine the authenticity of art materials okay. used in these diaries and their correlation with materials available during the war. Okay. Also, during the war, there is a scarcity of resources mm -hmm. Yet these authors had these mm. colorful arts in their diaries. How do you explain the presence of colorful art in diaries right. from wartime period, considering the scarcity and the challenging circumstances faced by individuals? Oh, awesome. But this is a very long story. <laughs> okay, number one, um, you're looking at uh, uh, something that is also absent within our own spaces is the study of the postal services during war. It's a very fascinating, it's a very fascinating history, but unfortunately I can only do that for Japan. Um, for Japan, what they did is the postal services were important, particularly because remember that World War II is an unpopular war for Japan. So the only reason for you to be able to rally up resources is to make sure that your nationals are not questioning the use of your taxpayers' money for this war. And hence, they created this very fascinating structure of the mail must go through, right? So each and every soldier that goes to war will be actually given as a, um, a, a supply of empty postcards, right? Because the important thing here is you have to make sure that they are constantly saying, I'm okay, I love you, miss you, B, right? And so on. So that at the same time, diba, they're like, wow, it's there. But, you know, um, someone as intelligent as Maeda's wife then realizes like, wait, my first is 001, now I'm in 0010. Where the hell is 002 to 008? One. So sometimes, unfortunately, the Americans would crash, uh, would burn the, uh, the um, postal boats, and hence they get destroyed, right? So, um, so in other words, if you're in the mountains, um, the camps would always collect all of these letters, bring it into the ports, and then ship it. And then they get redistributed again um, to wherever they're supposed to go. At the same time, in Japan, what becomes an interesting thing, which they did again for children, is in order for children to, record, to validate the war, what you had to do was to send care packages. Parang nagpa-pen pal ka to a soldier, right? Even if it's someone that you didn't know. So during, um, during the early educations of World War II, Japanese children, if we're in, let's say in a classroom, okay, kids, draw your favorite toy, draw your favorite dog, and just, you know, write to Mr. Soldier, this is my dog, so cute, right? Have candy that I got from my mom. And they put it into packages. Then they ship it to wherever the, um, wherever the war, um, war places are, and then the soldiers get a moral boost, like, oh, how cute, I get candy, right? <laughs> so, it, uh, so in other words, that's a very interesting form of, um, that's a very interesting form of concept. So um, in terms of supply, yes, but um, for Maeda, he also bought his art supplies, because, you know, artists, they have to paint. <laughs> On the other hand, for Komatsu, he was very, uh, he was more ingenuitive because he is a scientist. Scientists always have pen and their, their paper and their, their, their paper and their pencils. And that's why when you look at his art, his art is very, um, it's only black and white. Uh, he would only be, have access to color if he's in um, decent caps. So, um, so in other words, uh, 
contrary to what we know, the supplies were actually there uh, and for, for them. And because Japan loves analog during that time. For the Filipinos and for the Americans, I think, um, I think one of the talks will be on Dante's um, soon, the book launch. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is they don't do letters, they do telegram. So, you know, but, but, you know, part of the problem, and I listened to the talk, is, you know, if you get a telegram, sure, it's nice, but there is no emotive quality to it, because it's basically a typewritten thing. So, you know, it's also a combat of emotions, but there. Thank you. Absolutely prescient in your answer, because our next two questions from Zoom are about the Japanese Postal Service. Yeah. Uh, so the first one you've partially answered yeah. about, uh, this is from Joan Catherine Halbuena. You mentioned that some of the postcards sent by Maeda didn't get to his wife. Yeah. Was this likely because of censorship or just the postal not being very reliable? Oh, okay, there are two things. Um, one, it can be because of censorship because there are two layers of censorship that happen. On the first end, um, before they send it, they have, it's all read by their platoon leaders, unfortunately to ensure that there is no leakage. And that's why um, you have to sit down with the families because sometimes the families have codes, right? When you say like, how's your daughter? They, they, they change it to the idea, it means something else. So there's also that very intimate thing. That's why you have to be cautious in reading it. On the other hand, take note that the supply boats, um, supply boats going back and forth from the Philippines to Japan, they would always have as my last count was they would always have three a month, but that was prior to the um, that was prior to the aggressive embargoes of um, MacArthur. The moment that MacArthur has his submarines um, around the waters, open waters, and they sink um, these ships, then that's when it happens. So, uh, in other words, they have you have to you have to sort of create a. Um, corroborate whether at this time there was an attack by the Americans or not in order to know whether um, it was actually lost because of war or lost because of um, censorship. Yeah. About the Postal Service um, is from Francis Tampinko who says, was there a possibility, this has to do with Maeda's response actually, um, in his, um, I guess, intentionality. Was there a possibility that Maeda was concealing real feelings or war sentiments in his picturesque postcards, um, like maybe using things as metaphors, or would that be reading too much into this sort of correspondence? Uh, yes, actually, if, you, if you're able to understand Japanese, um, please listen to um, Mrs., um, Mrs. Maeda, but she got remarried. She's now Miss. Uh, um, she talks about how they've created that language, um, where when he writes, there are particular de details in either the art or in the text um, that uh, would at least not uh, would go through censors and pass. So um, there is the idea of him really communicating his feelings, right? Um, but from the art itself. When we just look at the postcard, he makes it safe because he also, as an art, as a trained artist, he recognizes that visuality, um, visuality is very, very um, easy to be uh, easy to be um, uh, censored. But what is surprising, if you look at my last pictures on um, on the war field, actually, oh sorry, if you go back to this, uh, sorry. Uh, pictures of the battlefield, even if they are illustrated, are illegal really? for Japan. Because, you, know, it, it, uh, you know, it's like in military intelligence, right? It positions you wherever you are. So that's why, to me, it, uh, if you're into military history, and that's why I, I, I know this, but I'm like, I'm not military historian. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, he, as depending on how accurate, uh, how great an artist he is, um, you'll be able to recognize the place, the position, and where they were. 
And if this was intercepted by enemy forces, in the same way that for the Americans, their um, telegram, telegraphs, they have to be careful about it with their radio, right? So it's the same um, in terms of that. But to me, this becomes an interesting concept that, wow, he's brave enough to actually illustrate this. If it was in Manila, it's okay. Because Intramur is okay. That's why you can just bump Intramuros and then, you know. But if it's like um, um, maneuvers and so on, it's quite dangerous. So it's a great thing. Anyway, thanks. Um, we'd like to extend very warm thanks and welcome to the Rod Hall family who is joining us over Zoom. And the daughter of Rod Hall has put in some comments sure. in the chat and she, because we're talking about the postal service, uh, yes. she notes that when my father was in Santa Tomas, he was interred there at UST during the war. He received postcards sent via the Red Cross, which would take three to four months. Yeah. And yes, the postcards from his mother were also written in code. Yeah. Um, what would be the, in the examples you've given, the Japanese examples, what would be the length of time typically for the postcards uh, correspondence? It, it depends, actually, because, uh, oh wait, um, for Maeda, he would only be in Luzon, so it, it's easy. As for Luzon, essentially, you're just, you, uh, but it depends. If you're in the mountains, then they have to bring it down to the mountains, depending on how aggressive the guerrilla forces and the, the resistance are. Um, letters of Maeda would um, come, to, come to the wife at least a month after the date, which is impressive, right? But she would also notice some delays, which means that um, that's also an un spoken rule that he is in danger because the longer the the dates are important because it also tells you how long it took for the letter to be written and to be received to her uh so that's also an unspoken unwritten message of sorts um the longest at least for her was uh if I'm not mistaken, she would receive, um, she didn't know that her last, uh, that her second to her last um, postcard is actually the postcard prior, the day before his husband died. So it's only later on that she recognized that because sometimes they just keep on sending, keep on sending and keep on sending and once they're dead, it's sent, but it's, she's dead. You know, it, that's part of that tragedy as well. Yeah. Our next question is from Emelita Samala, who says, what suggestion can you share about how students can check the correctness of sources, considering uh, the Lolas have spoken and okay. they are speaking from their experiences? Right. Thank oh. you. Oh, okay. Um, wait, this, become, this becomes a very um, complex answer, particularly when we're dealing with memory. Um, a lot of oral historians tend to work with the idea that you have to constantly talk to them. In other words, one sit down is not enough. Um, the, the reason here is you have to ensure the, you have to ensure that what they're telling is the same thing over and over again. So it's very meticulous, right? Um, but the danger here is it now depends on whether you have to gain the trust of your, uh, of your interviewee particularly if your interviewee is uh, impatient right if they if you know like why are you asking this again didn't i sell, tell this to you or sometimes it, if they're not as vocal they actually um they actually abridge their memories sometimes so that's where it becomes tricky so rather than and in the same way for me i'm not just looking at the I'm, I'm not actually just looking at the letters as the truth itself. I'm always corroborating it with something real, uh, not, not real, sorry. I'm something that is also outside within the space. So like, um, that's why I had to look at um, postal history because I had to go to the um, museum of, um, the, the postal museum of Japan to see, okay, what are the dates? Where did they go? And so on. So you sort of try to create the accuracies that are there, right? Um, becomes tricky for Komatsu because actually another thing is because he, he wrote all of the visceralities and realities in his diary, he was not supposed to bring it home. He's not allowed to bring it home. And to have 11 diaries is illegal. 
So if I'm not mistaken, uh, I can't remember. Um, his grandson made a very proud cuento. Eh, na parang, I think he stuffed it in an urn or something, a burial urn or something, um, in order to just bring it home so that it doesn't get ins inspected. That's why you were able. That's why he was able to have all eleven um, that is there, um, particularly if you are from the field itself. So yeah. Carl, this may be a question that is beyond the scope of the talk, but sure. since you brought it up in discussing oral histories, um, the, the postcards and other items you've been discussing today yeah. really are a form of material history. Okay. Um, is there still a divide between, for lack of a better term, legitimacy about mm. one form of remembering versus yeah. another? Um, yes, in the sense that, and, and exactly that, um, if you notice, uh, not that, I haven't seen anyone write about postcards, illustrations, right? Um, art historians would tend to work with high art, right? That's why we have a lot of criticisms and histories about Amarsola, right? But um, if we then look at low art, such as comics, um, not everyone, that was my MA thesis, nag advertise, no. Um, <laughs> uh, my MA thesis was on Ken Koi during World War II, right? And even the Velasquez's have not even recognized that their father, um, their, um, their patriarch had actually participated in propaganda activities during that time. So there, this, there, it's unfortunately um, an issue in, in not, not, only Philippine history, in histories in the sense that they seem to have that unfortunate hierarchies of what's supposed to be meaningful and non-meaningful sources. But because I'm an idiot that's tamad, I'm lazy to read, you know, uh, high material. So I actually like low material itself simply because of its, the simplicity of its um, verbiage, right? Um, whether it gains, uh, whether it gains, um, uh, interest or not, I, I, I like looking at, I like the quent, I like the stories that I see here, right? Because um, in some situations, um, when you read a lot of the memoirs, sometimes the information is just repetitive. Uh, why? Because the political economy during that time, they're just writing what they know and they're repeating what, what people have heard so far. So essentially, you know, there's nothing different or nothing new that you see um, in these spaces sometimes, right? Um, so to explore alternative material allows you to either question um, or at least have a different frame in um, looking at the, uh, looking at that historical period as well. So yeah. And we, our next question is from Joel Mel Christian Liza, who asks, good afternoon, Professor Chua. Are the concepts of afterlives and problems of peace depicted in the, Philipp in the Philippine literature in the Japanese occupation era and in Japanese haikus? Mm. Okay, um, why I say afterlives is um, one of the first things I teach in my history classes is um, what do we, how do we define history? We tend to look at, you know, a lot of the students, the eager ones would say, oh, you know, we study history because we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Or you, you often repeat the often gas gas statement of Rizal, yung, ano yun, ang hindi maruno makitungo sa whatever, whatever. So it's like, uh, uh, you know, fine. Um, but um, I'm actually operating under a, a, a different mode. I'm not looking at learning from the mistakes of the past, but the past has never gone. In other words, part of the reason of your being is because of your historical past, right? It's not about repeating itself. And that's part of the reason I wrote this. I cannot take away from the fact that I'm Filipino, that, uh, that my history includes World War II, my history includes um, the Spanish colonial period and the American colonial period. I cannot remove that. In other words, my vision for it will always, my um, my perceptions of how I read things is placed within the histories that I've experienced. Right? And that's why, that's why we have to study history. <laughs> but in other words, history has ne is never gone. We'll see it. Um, I know I'm opening a can of worms here, right? Like um, why we still have our issues with our present histories, martial law, um, and so on, right? It's because it was never gone. It's 
always there. And how we deal with it as we're living within our own spaces is quite fascinating. Just to, um, just to sort of a little off tangent, I, in Facebook, I just saw this interesting, she's an art, uh, she, she has an art display right now where she talks about in her Facebook page how unusual it is that um, in the past she was fighting against the Marcoses and now in her exhibit, she's now bringing Bong Bong and explaining her exhibits to um, Bong Bong Marcos. So what happens in this case? It, it actually tells you exactly that, the idea that history is never gone, right? But how do you then deal with those positions? We are living, we're currently living in a society where we, we you know, and Something else is, as it's great that I have a demographically diverse um, audience that is here. Our histories, our experiences are also varied. So much so that um, the more experienced members of this, uh, of this audiences have a different line of history to the younger ones. And what does that do? How do you, how do you then um, uh, engage in that histories? Right? And how do you then understand the discrepancies of your histories with each other? So there. So it's the idea of um, we're living within our histories. And we have to deal with it in one way or another. Carl, may we have permission to use that as a hashtag? <laughs> History is never gone yeah. when we uh, yeah, put yeah. up the YouTube video of oh, this sure. talk. Um, but since you did open up the can of worms, it's very interesting that at the start of your talk, you were discussing the, I don't know what to call it, the rhetoric of victimhood, mm. right? And one of the draws of that is that the art is looked at and it becomes mm. ahistorical. Right. Um, the postcards are a great example. You, if you gave them to an audience and gave them zero context, right, it would be very, very aesthetically pleasing. We would find it really attractive and yeah. people might be shocked to discover that that is actually yeah. war art. Yeah. So how do we deal with that challenge of, um, because it seems to be embedded in yeah. the rhetoric, this a history. Um, yeah. How do we deal with that? Um, it's a matter of, and, and to me, I'm a very lazy, uh, my, my attitude towards a lot of things is I'm very lazy fair. You let it happen. I don't cancel people. But, but the idea is you make them know, know what it is. For example, like, right, um, the National Museum has Amarsala's pictures that are there. Very beautiful when you see it. A lot of the kids, they take selfies about it. And, you know, but no one actually positions that um, the beautiful Amarsala paintings, right? You don't, uh, these people don't realize that, you know, these were painted, these were painted by a, an elite Filipino in the midst of war. Where is war here? It's so beautiful, right? So it creates that problem. So in other words, we have to constantly contextualize. That's what museums, that's what collections are, so, are supposed to be for. That you're not just supposed to just place pieces that are there to like, take picture of them and appreciate them. The more you know about it, the more you, you, you're able to then um, engage in its complexity, right? Um, and so on. So for me, um, it's that. that um, why, I, why rather than just, you know, the, the flattened idea, let's talk about the postcards and its beauty. Um, to me, I cannot settle with that. Eh? I have to recognize that there is an afterlife to each of these materials, particularly when you are now working with a material that goes to an audience it was never intended for. That can be like an art that was supposed to be um, commissioned to a particular collector. Then when it gets, uh, when it gets displayed in a, uh, in a museum, Right, you see its, you know, you see its beauty, but not a lot of people will then say, "Oh crap!" You know, all of these elite people and all their money, right, <laughs> and suffering. <laughs> so, so you know, it, and that's how it's moving, right? Context is important. Ah, oh, yes, John. Ah, yes, ma'am. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, hi. I just wanted to add. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Professor Ambet Ocampo did give a talk. Yeah. Uh, on on artworks that um, 
Amor Solo did during the war yeah. as a witness to the war because apparently he was stuck yeah. in Manila. Yeah. And so uh, to, to sort of survive, he sketched what yeah, he saw. Yeah. And, and I know it's in some book. And then uh, we also have uh, in my father's collection, a small Amor Solo, yeah. and it's called Rape of yeah. Manila, yeah. which is um, a Japanese ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. soldier looming over the body of a, yeah. of, of a woman. No? So uh, he may not have done it a lot, mm. but there was a point in, in his life yeah. where he did it. And I, and I remember because, you know, Ambeth lectures here, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and he dedicated uh, a, sec a lecture of it on that. Yeah. Just thanks. To say. yeah, thanks, Din Ma'am. Um, and that's why um, the nice thing is, especially with these books, um, the first one, it's only 62 out of 500. So remember that that's also something that you can work with in creation. Unfortunately, um, it depends on whether we have the full collection or whether it's intentional for the curator of the material. But um, the moment that we engage in that conversation, there is viscerality to his art, then how do we now engage in that conversation with this artist, right? So it, it further complicates it rather than just do this black and white thing. And that's why afterlife still exists. The more and more, the farther we are from our pasts, the more we are now open to engaging in it or the more that we're able to find a baul where there's someone hidden there and something that's hidden there and then, <gasps> wow, it adds new things to that history. Yeah. So thanks, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to add because, you know, we were fortunate enough to, to know Rod when he was alive. Yeah. And I remember um, that at one point uh, he told us that when he got out of the UST internment, so he was quickly sent abroad to school, he never told his classmates mm. that he had gone through the war. Mm. He just sealed his lips. Yeah. And did not talk about it. So when you're saying that, you know, it's it's that experience is so difficult to deal with. Yeah. And so when we started this whole series on commemorating World War II, yeah. many of the survivors came yeah. and only talked about it 60 years later. Mm. I mean, it was it. And so Rod is a perfect example. He was, I think, 12 or 13 when he was sent to the States, and he never talked about it yeah. until then he decided i will now collect things to tell the world what it was all about so i think just so that you have context about who this gentleman is yeah uh, that we're commemorating with this uh with this lecture yeah thanks thank you my question buddy i can see mom thanks marie less for that <laughs> I'm Dr. Carol Jomanter from the NCCA, oh, okay. Hi, and I'm looking at it, and I came here purposely, intentionally, because I want to, to understand culture. Okay, these are diaries, these mm. are memoirs yeah. of Japanese soldiers, I yes. understand, uh, coming to conquer us. Yes. Sorry for the victim. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. were trying to erase well, the, delete the victim thing, but... Yeah, yeah we were never the aggressors yes we were so fresh from the spanish and the 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 american occupation and then here comes the japanese so there was no way any filipino guerrilla or any soldier at that point writing memoirs as well yes so uh, a parallel um diary is quite impossible. All the materials at the NCCA, at the National Museum that we have, are, are hindsight yeah. writings yeah. or material or documents, mere documents of the Cartilia, of the Katipunan, of... Now, I, I don't have a question, but yeah. I'd like to appreciate the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the, this lecture because I'm looking at it from the point of view of culture. Yeah. Here is a Japanese, an Asian like us, yeah. okay? Uh, relating to his wife. Yeah. Sana kung nagkaroon ng isang guerrilla na nag, nagsulat din sa kanyang, sa kanyang asawa, it would have been the same because yeah. the same intensity, coding and things yeah, yeah, like yeah. that of, Na is a censor. Na, right. There would always be censorship. I, I saw that also. So UST 
um, library and museum that there were attempts to to write yung yeah. mga pasabilis to na mga guerrilla in Pampanga, but then it, it was really censored, yeah. Yeah. Um, censorship because the Filipinos were divided and so hindi mo alam whom to trust. And uh, you know, your very intensive, wag mo sabihin tamad ka, uh, your, that intensive look and study on on the art form because there were no writings, no pigafetta files, walang hindi katulad ng mga Spaniards noon na nagkikwento back to the homeland of how yeah. how lazy the Filipinos were, how yeah. how ineffective and how yeah. kadiri this this colony was. The Japanese, even if you find it idyllic and things like that, they were saying a lot how beautiful this country is. Yeah. There might be no warm welcome uh, insinuated and new ones, but the fact that they were receiving and could write and then the postal service, there was communication. I, I find it very Asian. I find it trying to connect, trying to... Maganda yung, yung tignan din siya sa punto de vista ng kultura. Here is an Asian... Um, you're Chinese, yes. working on Japanese and Filipino materials. Yeah, yeah. The Asianness of your study comes out. And thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, just to Anna Dinpa, thanks, ma'am, for your comment. But um, there, are, uh, there are multiple layers of how you can actually define art. I'm actually using his liberal um, loosely. As ma'am had mentioned, I'm looking at um, postcards and diaries, right? And when I gave this talk in Japan, um, an art historian said, that is not art. <laughs> so, but I had, to, um, I had to then argue within this space, why, were, why our group actually labeled it as art? So you have to look at it within the, within the space of when it was created. As it, it's related to the question um, mentioned early, that war makes you have limited supplies. So how do you create beauty? in a space of nothingness and um in some of my some of my partners um who who did this what was their war art their war art was chopsticks that they made with bamboo um slippers that they made um mahjong tiles <laughs> and so on so in other words um we were looking at that definition simply because while they are material objects we now in the present state are able to then see it as part of that um, part of a um, part of that genre of art that's there. It's a picture, right? Uh, it's a we like the the um, the chopsticks can be sculptures, yeah? and so on. So you know there are these types of um, concepts, but we contextualize it in the period of war so much so that we can then go back into the Philippines. What was created during that time? What were these things that were created? Like um, I know in some of the research where when we, when we lost glass, we used bamboo cups as our, as our utensils. That can be art if you want to think about it. So how will the art historians then think about, you know, the carving and stuff? But anyway, yun pa. Carl, we are running short of time, but sure. since you brought up that idea, yeah. uh, perhaps this could be our final question. I really was wondering what, because um, you mentioned earlier that we don't have Philippine war art mm. in the similar way yeah. um, as the ah. Japanese. Um, is it because it simply doesn't exist oh. and people have to think creatively about what is considered war art? Yeah. Or is it because similar to some of these postcards it hasn't been released or published um, so we don't know about it uh, it depends because uh when you think about it publications were still in existence liway Wai was there um there's a lot of the and a lot of something that we also haven't come to terms with was during the american colonial period there were a lot of professional artists right um that were in existence during this time so what and we never question what happened to them during the war, right? We cannot just assume that these are, these are elites that just went to their, you know, 
uh, wherever, but they had to they had to create, which means that um, either we can see it in what old Philippine history would label as propaganda, not art, or we can actually look at it in publications, or in some cases, uh, okay, um, in Iloilo, uh, I was talking to John about this. One of the important things that was being circulated, an important key item are matchboxes for matches, because you know, but what do you do? You, you, you paint the matchboxes, right? And I mean, in America, the, there, there's a lot of matchbox collectors, not only in America, but in some crazy spaces. But these, we have to now be creative enough to imagine, where will these people go? Because <laughs> they will not just go hungry. They will not just be passive in their experience. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just there, but I, I'm, you know, I don't have access to them. So if you have them, then show them, please. <laughs> Yeah. And that is it. That brings us to the end of our Q&A. Thank you again, Carl, for the engaging presentation and discussion. May I ask you to remain in front while our Senior Director for Arts and Culture, Ms. Mary Less, and the Head of the Library, uh, John Labellio, will join you for a quick presentation. And if you would like to explore other examples of war art in the Japanese holdings of the Roderick Hall collection, FHL has prepared a special book list. Uh, the two key titles that were discussed are, of course, there. The first one is in the top left-hand corner, which is Pictorial Letters from the Battlefield to My Wife. And Carl, I can't find the second one, but the second one is the... Oh... Uh, the Hidden Battle of Leyte, which is on the top right-hand corner. So those are the two key books. Uh, but there are, of course, many other titles there that I cannot read, but again, you can look at the images. And there are two more talks in this year's Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures. We hope that you'll be able to join us on Saturday, March 9, as Dr. Thomas McKenna returns via Zoom for the second part of his exploration of World War II in Mindanao. After last year's very successful The Unsung Heroes of Mindanao, Dr. McKenna will return with Cam Lon's Rebellion, 1948 to 1955, a forgotten Sulu insurgency and the hidden legacies of World War II. Finally, Dr. Catherine Luxon, a scholar of women's history and a professor at Ateneo de Manila, uh, concludes the series in March 23. Uh, this talk will be both on site here at Ayala Museum and also through Zoom. She will continue where Genevieve Clutario left off last year, tracing women's history. If you enjoy today's free Today's free lecture, please follow FHL social media pages for updates, as well as the Ayala Foundation and the Ayala Museum. You can find us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube. Please stay safe and stay healthy, and we'll see you at the next Rod Hall lecture. <laughs>
with us in the Filipinas Heritage Library. So in 2010, Rod shipped his entire collection, lock, stock, and barrel of 700 volumes from his home in London to FHL in Makati. Through the years, his collection has grown to more than 2,000 print and non-print materials on World War II, making the Roderick Hall collection FHL's crown jewel. As such, it is FHL's centerpiece, literally and figuratively, because we now revolve our collection focus around the period immediately before, during, and right after World War II, identified as the formative period of Philippine nationhood. To collect books and various other historical materials relating to the Philippines during that war, and to make this more accessible to the general public. He turned this collection over to the Filipinas Heritage Library, where it now forms a major part of its holdings as the Roderick Hall Collection. But Rod was not one to simply donate books. He wanted other people to use them and to research more on the war. He wanted to add more materials. He was constantly in search of new directions for the collection. To this end, he was able to negotiate digitization of numerous manuscripts in various collections around the Philippines. He wanted to provide as many different perspectives as possible. And when he learned of the large body of works in Japanese, aimed to acquire as much as possible for the collection. Why are you collecting Japanese publications about the Battle of the Philippines, even though you do not understand Japanese language? You said to me, I always answer the, this question like that. I want next future generation to know what happened in Philippines during the Asia Pacific War and the Philippines under Japanese rule. However, you told me the real reason is that collecting Japanese books is to make peace of my mind and making requiem for my deceased family. As a post-war Japanese generation, I promise you to try to make no more war society and also to try not to create the kind of people such as you and your family horribly experienced in Philippines. I think the Japanese should know the facts of this history. I believe this is my mission as a Japanese. Previous century, its many upheavals and wars, is that we all have an ethical obligation to remember that history. But understandably, not everyone takes up that burden because the memory of war, especially for persons who witnessed it, is painful. The late Mr. Rod Hall was deeply courageous in that sense of taking up an ethical burden 
He took pains to give World War II its proper mourning, not just for himself, but also for our country, America and Japan, whose materials he collected. He helped strengthen our cultural memory in the hope of preventing the return of suffering. And now with his passing, we in turn at Philippines Heritage Library and Ayala Foundation have an obligation to make his legacy and his commemoration of history endure. 